Hey friends out there in YouTube land, Rob here today. I want to talk to you about the Fujifilm Instax Neo Classic, the Mini 90. This film right here is a fully analog instant camera from Fujifilm that shoots the mini sized film. Mini is the credit card size format, which is roughly three inches by two inches. Today we're going to talk about this camera and I want to give a little bit of a primer that this camera is the Mini 90 called the Neo Classic. However, this camera, if you guys are watching online, you can see right here, this camera is the Mini Evo. That's the digital analog hybrid. And the reason that that's so important is that the digital analog hybrid is actually just a digital camera with a printer on the back of it. That's important because I wanted to show you just kind of how Fujifilm has developed their Instax line of cameras over the years. The Neo Classic, the Mini 90, that's the full name, Mini, the Neo Classic Mini 90, is an analog version and the older version from 2017, possibly even before I became aware of this camera and purchased one in 2017. Notice how in order to take a photo, the lens must extend, and that extends because we have to have room for the lens to actually focus the film or the light on the film, directly on the film. So your image would be in here, your print would be in here, and it would eject this way. Notice the entire uh, camera obscura in there, that, that exposed area for the camera. When we look at the Mini 90 right here, you'll notice that as we open the Mini 90, there is no camera obscura. There's no sensor, there's no lens to open. It simply prints the image onto the film after the lens has exposed an image onto the sensor. So two very different ways of going about creating an image. The difference being that the uh, Mini Evo allows for you to reprint your images because they're all digital images. Whereas the Neo Classic, the Mini 90, creates an analog one of a kind image that's directly exposed onto your film from the lens. That's kind of cool. In fact, that's what makes analog photography so fun and interesting. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, let's go ahead and give this a little walk around as we do, let's check it out. We've closed it down, works on a battery, a rechargeable and replaceable battery that you can get directly from Fujifilm. One comes with the camera when you get it and these are still being sold. It's an excellent camera with a lot of functions. In fact, the Mini 90 represents the pinnacle of Fujifilm's um, analog photography with the most controls you'll have out of any of their cameras. Don't ask me why Fujifilm will never give us a fully manual analog or fully manual camera like Instax camera. They haven't done that yet. We have to look to other companies like Mint in order to get those types of features. But here we are, and this is what Fujifilm gives us. And I can't really argue with their results. When we look at the images, we're gonna find quite a bit of consistency throughout. So let's get around to it. As we look at the front, the images are made to be taken in the portrait orientation. And as such, we have a shutter button which functions as a selfie mirror right here. You can actually frame that up pretty easily just by angling it when you go to take your photo. Moving from there, we have a viewfinder that's offset from the actual lens, which means there could be some kind of parallax. Parallax is the difference in what you see based on what the film will be exposed through through the lens, what the lens sees. And that's why this image is kind of slightly offset. I'll show you some more offset parallax issues later and give you some pro tips on how to avoid that. We also have a real flash. This flash is a xenon flash, which means it's bright and powerful. And because it's a xenon flash, we can set other off-camera strobes to actually look for bright high intensity lights to flash at the same time that it sees them. Meaning that you can use this flash to trigger other off-camera strobes if you want to improve or add some excitement to your photography. We also have a lens ring right here that moves. This is actually our mode ring. And we're gonna find that this will allow us to change some settings on the camera while we're shooting and the camera's powered on, but I don't find it to be that useful for me and don't use it very often. I think that they could have implemented this in a slightly different way, and we'll talk about that when we get there. When we turn the camera on, I want you to notice that the lens does extend, and we can see that the uh, aperture of the lens is opened up through the uh, lens cover, or a better way to say it is that there's, that's not the aperture, it just has a um, self-protecting lens cap that co closes and turns back on once we get it. Okay, cool. Now let's turn around to the back of the camera. The back of the camera is where we're gonna find all of our cool functions. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the camera on just so that you can see. It's a lot of fun to watch. The camera's turned on. 
And as we're looking right here, this is not backlit, but hopefully that you can see, I'll hold it up just a little bit. It's showing that we have our film counter meter as well as our mode meter or our mode window. There is no film in here as you've seen earlier, so it's just showing like a little dash or something. If there was film in there, it would show. Here we have our main window, window and the buttons underneath will allow us to have different functions turned on or off. Currently right now, uh, it's just showing our battery indication. And the battery is of course full and our battery is right down here, you can see. And when you buy this camera, it comes with a charger for the battery. So the full battery indicator is there and then the very first button that we have is a macro button. Now, when we push the macro button, we see a little macro light come on, a little uh, macro indicator. But also, as we push these buttons, you'll notice that as you turn macro on and off, the camera is actually switching its focusing modes. That's because this camera is a zone focus camera. That's a very important thing to know. In fact, all except for the digital hybrid Instax cameras by Fujifilm and the majority of the cameras out there on the market that shoot instant film are zone focus lenses, which means you can't get precise focus, you have to get focus in a particular zone. In this case, macro is roughly arm's length, they're about three feet and closer. Normal is about three feet to 12 or 10 feet, somewhere around there, about two meters. And then mountain or far focus, which we'll talk about later, is anything from about three meters to infinity. Okay. So now that we've seen that, let's go ahead and talk about these different focusing modes. I'm gonna to have to get down here and kind of look to see. So as we press our mode button, the mode button cycles through. When you don't see any mode indicator at the very front, that means that you're in normal mode. So you're roughly uh, between uh, one meter and three meters, about three feet and uh, 12 feet, nine feet, somewhere in there. That's where the camera is going to automatically focus. When you press the button, your mode or focus indicators flash, and then you press it again to change the mode. Once it stops flashing, it will then go into the proper settings for that mode for both aperture, shutter speed, as well as your focus zone. In this case, you saw something that looks like a party come up. This little party indicator right here is actually going to uh, allow the camera to take a slower shot, right, for things that might happen in a darker party, and it's going to use, generally speaking, the wider aperture of the apertures that the camera has range of. The camera ranges on aperture between f12 to f22 and shutter speed from about 30 seconds to 1 400th of a second. So there's not a lot of room there to wiggle and make exposures brighter when it comes to aperture, but there is some wiggle room when it comes to shutter speed. When we set our mode, we're actually telling the camera which shutter speeds to use and it will choose shutter speeds and apertures that will make sense for that type of direction. So when using this ca uh, camera, you must set the mode the way that you want it to. Okay, so the next thing is after we have that, we then go to the one that looks like a little kid with a hat on. I know this is kind of hard to see guys, but that kid with the hat on right there is gonna tell you kids at play. It's generally gonna use a smaller aperture as well as a uh, faster shutter speed to try to keep motion blur from happening. This also has the unintended consequence of sometimes making your images darker. These are just things that you should know uh, because you don't have a lot that you can do to adjust that, but we do have a couple of things we can do. We'll get to those in just a moment. Then we have mountain. Once we move to mountain, we're gonna find the first time that our focus will change. It actually became a shorter lens. I'll show you that in just a second. So it changed the focus so that it can focus further away. Remember, we're talking things more than three meters away. And in this instance, it's going to also give us, generally speaking, a smaller aperture, but the shutter speed could be longer or slower. So it's not gonna necessarily try to give us the, a faster shutter speed. It will use the longer shutter speeds uh, as well in this mode. Pressing the mode button again to bring them back up. We're now going into double exposure. In this mode, it will go back to the normal focusing. So one meter to three meters. So uh, basically three feet to nine feet, maybe up to 12, somewhere in there. And it will use any shutter speed that it needs in order to get the shot exposed correctly. And it will take a total of two shots and then automatically eject the film. And every one of these other modes, it will automatically eject the film after the exposure has been made, except for double exposure mode, which we're in right now. Now, there's another thing to note, if you're doing photos with double exposure, photograph your darkest picture first, and then overlay a lighter composition on top of it in order to get the best uh, results. In any event, we're gonna press that mode button one more time, and now we're going on to the mode that is called bulb. Now, bulb mode will keep the lens open for as long as you're pressing the, uh, 
keep the shutter open for as long as you're pressing the shutter button. So here we go. Notice that you can see through there. <laughs> well, not now, but you can now. Notice you can see through and you're seeing, there we go. See, it's just like that. Okay, now that that's happened, uh, we have gone through all of the uh, focusing modes and the next mode, if we press it again, will take us back to normal. Notice nothing's in there. Nothing's being represented in this display, so we're in the normal shooting mode, which is uh, generally speaking, once again, between one meter and three meters and any of the shutter speed ranges. Now we've talked about the modes and we jumped to all these other buttons because we wanted to show you here, we actually have some, well, exposure compensation type of features, if you want to call it. Remember, the camera will only expose within the range that it can. So up to one four hundredth of a second and down slower, as well as from F12 to F22. In this particular instance, the L slash D means lighten or darken. So we can lighten once, lighten even more, so that's one and a half stops, or darken one complete stop. So we have up to one and a half stops of lighten. We have well, minus one stop of darken exposure compensation. And it will tell you what you're doing here by selecting that little LED readout or the LCD readout. D for darken, back to normal mode, lighten, lighten plus, and then darken. Okay, we also have self timer. So when we turn our self timer on, the self timer will of course count down. And then we have a flash on and off. You can manually turn your flash on and off. This is something that's not generally available in the Mini A, Mini 11, Mini 12, things like that series of cameras. So this was a feature that was really important to this particular camera. We're still on darken, so we're gonna go ahead and turn darken off. And I'm gonna turn back around and talk to you about that mode function. Now we're on flash right here. We did talk about our flash on and off, but we can also have a red eye reduction. So we press it once uh, and we're on no flash. We press it a second time, we're on flash and then we press it a third time, we're on red eye reduction and then back through it just cycles in those ways. This front ring right here would actually switch through all of your focusing and exposure modes, but only after you press the mode button. So now that we're there, you can see maybe that it'll start changing something. Remember, not all modes will change. Let's go here. And that's the reason that I don't find it very useful. Because this mode won't automatically change your shooting exposure conditions and the exposure modes that it's got, you have to first press your mode button, which just, as you can see right here, just trying to demo it, makes it completely unusable. Okay, so let's talk about how your images are actually exposed. Fujifilm uses a positive exposure method. It's a positive sigma process. I actually did a when many years ago, I did a whole thing on the white paper for, or the technical uh, limitations and specifications of Fujifilm Instax mini film or their whole process. It was really cool, but dense and fun. So if you like that, go check, you'll see it back 2017 era videos. However, our images are exposed like this. So what we see is actually the back. And this is why we don't need to have a reversal film because as the image is exposed with the light through the lens here, the exposure makes the back of the image, but the image is actually upside down. In this instance, it's exposed here, and then as it ejects, the film capsule with development material is popped and spread across the film. So your image comes out of the camera like this, and as it were to develop, you will see just an upside down image rather than a negative image present itself, which means that if you're taking photos, because of this process, you can take pictures of words and things like that, and they will always be in the readable proper orientation. Okay, so that's pretty cool about how it works, a little bit of technical stuff there, but that's just fun because we were talking about that port. There is a tripod mount right here, and that's offset from the lens. It can make it a little tricky to get good compositions, but it's not really that big of a deal. And then at the top, we have a shutter release for when we want to photograph in landscape orientation. However, you're gonna get the best kind of images with this camera in portrait orientation, in my opinion. But let's have a look at that real quick. What I wanna first share with you is how awesome this camera is at just photographing pictures and consistency. 
As we see, the Mini 9 is standing right there. At some point in time, the camera will, will enter auto power off and you'll see that close, but I'll leave it open now just so that you can see. And what I'd like to share with you is the consistency about these images. Now, this one was taken by my son and um, did a great job framing this up, but you can see we're not exactly centered on the frame and that's because the lens and the viewfinder aren't centered. And this is actually a pretty great uh, type of image that you can get, but when you get close with parallax, you always need to focus just a little bit inward of your subject. So if you're taking the picture, if you were the person taking this photo, instead of lining the viewfinder up with your people or your subject, you would actually line your viewfinder up slightly to the left, which would cause the lens to move slightly to the left and then recenter your images. This is only an issue when you're photographing close up and it becomes more apparent when you're doing things like taking a selfie, something we'll talk about in a minute. However, when we're just photographing, look at how great these, these pictures are. Very nice color, even after seven years, they look wonderful, nice and vibrant, still contrasty, they're not blown out, they look great, blue skies, the whole ball of wax. Even when we're photographing something like a little kid on a swing, they work great. Some more types of pictures that we're gonna get with this are gonna be even action shots. So in this particular shot, this is a type of camera that you don't have to be worried about taking into the water. Just keep it from getting too wet. Don't submerge it, obviously. But at 100 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever you might get them for you new or used right here, it's a great picture to just run around and take photos with. Even portraits out underneath the shade and trees come out great with some light and the flash. As we continue looking, climbing on rocks in a forested location, or even over here taking family pictures with something like a family reunion, visiting grandmother, things like that, the images come out. Just really, just really great. When we talk about the camera, I wanna share with you some thoughts about how to get these images. I'm constantly thinking about specific, how far away, how close I am to somebody, which means I'm constantly thinking about the zone. So generally speaking, I'm going to be in normal mode with flash plus lighten, okay? Now you might say to yourself, why do you need flash and lighten? And the reason is quite simple. When you're outside shooting in the daylight, this camera will likely use an f-stop of 22, an f-22, and that's really dark. The only other option that we have is f-12, but we can't get to that because Fujifilm doesn't allow us to use that wider aperture. And if you're in a mode like the kids play mode or the sport mode, it's going to always use f22, which is going to give us a very small aperture in our lens, meaning a dark image. So I use the Lighten and Lighten Plus as well as Flash to add as much light back to the image to help keep the image, the subject itself, from being underexposed. Now, I've got some examples of underexposed subjects when that wasn't used, and here's one right here. If you're just shooting normal, you may find that you don't get the image that you want or the exposure that you want. And even if you are using the Lighten and all that other stuff right there, you may still find that the images are dark. That's because Fujifilm, Instax Mini Film, and all instant film for that matter, requires quite a bit of ambient light, which means I'd give you a tip of don't use this particular camera or this film in an area or an environment where it's dark, like for a photo booth. This is not a camera to use for your wedding photo booth. It just is not. If you were gonna do that, use the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo. Um, as you see here, just taking a selfie shot works pretty well. However, don't forget, why do we, or don't forget about white balance is what I'm talking about. White balance, right? So this is daylight balanced film, 5600 Kelvin, outside, yellow light. We're inside in this shot. So there's a greenish hue to the background and it's a little bit darker. You can also see how that sh um, flash creates rough shadows. You don't see a lot of shadows here in outdoor pictures because there's nothing behind the subject to capture the shadow so that you can tell that there was one. So don't take pictures inside with a lot of flash or if you do, just expect that this is gonna happen. Another shot outdoors, wonderful little picture, nice shot, see a lot of good stuff, beautiful saturation in the sky, quite a bit of detail in the image that's going on. But also, when we start to take these environmental style shots, we recognize that on the Instax medium, uh, the detail or the picture size is so much smaller that we begin to lose that detail in the image that we're trying to show. So it's a balancing act of how close to get versus what you're going to actually be able to see. So when you're taking pictures, what you'll notice for me is most of my images are taking at 50% or the portrait, you know, belly button up, or in a way that can get more of the subject in the shot.
there we go, it just closed up. But using flash, specifically off-camera flash, is important for images like this. Because in this particular shot, we just saw earlier that we were taking a picture in a similar environment that was too dark, the one right here. No external flash, right? But here I've actually used, in the cloudy setting with this camera, an external flash to pair with the xenon flash there to fire on the slave mode and gotten quite a bit of extra light. Now, how much extra light are you going to need? That based itself on your experience. But generally speaking, I put the strobe um, generally about six feet away and I put it on a quarter power to start. And then if it's too dark, I take another picture. Anyways, check that out. Isn't that so cool? Using an Instax camera with an off-camera strobe in slave mode at about a quarter power to get this kind of a shot. It was really cool. I mean, it's just exciting. Here, we've just used the regular flash on the camera. Similar environment, but notice what happens. We're in a shady environment, and because we don't have another daylight balanced light like a strobe, we're actually getting a more greenish hue because of the environment that we're in, which is we're at a forest, probably Red Wing Park here, and photographing underneath some foliage, and it's green, so there's a green hue. When we're out in bright, beautiful light, think a nice day at the beach, you're going to get exactly what you expect, bright daylight balanced photos, because that's an asset of the film. The film is a daylight balanced film. Now that we've talked about that, I wanna share with you a couple more, because this is uh, the kind of thing that you can expect when it talks about how you would use this camera in a professional setting. I'm always looking at a way to take a camera that I enjoy my use for, uh, my own personal endeavors, but also use it for something that makes me some money. And here we go. We've got a shot right here of a wedding that I photographed. This was probably 2016, 2017. No, more like 2017. I can't remember. And what I want to share with you is the environmental type of shot that you can get when your subject is large. So this is at Kerala, North Carolina. This is a 24-room uh, beach house. This is a huge wedding they ordered an Instax photo book, and I gave them all the photos from this camera, 100 instant film prints that went along with that. They paid like $700 for that book of just those images all taken with this camera. And I believe I also used the Mint TL70 on that one as well. Uh, just a lot of fun and something that they truly enjoy. Now, as we look at that, we now wanna talk about how this camera can be used to get pictures of like the dress. This is a difficult shot, but look at this beautiful, image of the dress hanging in the window. We've got detail in the bookcase. I understand that it may be kind of difficult to see on the camera, but there's detail in the bookcase as well as we can see through the window. So this is the type of shot that brides usually love to get with their, um, uh, you know, their dress and a window, stuff like that. And it's just a, a really nice shot. Of course, on a digital camera, we touch this up more, but as it's only photos straight through the lens of this particular camera right here, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. Now we got another one where this is where when you're using an instant camera that's completely automatic with very limited exposure controls, this is where we begin to have a little bit of an issue. Here is where we can see our bride and our groom there at the altar. And with this particular camera, uh, I was not able to get the shot that I wanted even with using an additional strobe. Now, of course, I had my strobes lined up so that they would be ready when my assistants were using these strobes. So one of two things happened in this particular shot. Either the light wasn't bright enough to make it to the flash in order to come on for the strobe mode, or uh, the someone was in the way of that direct line of sight communication. In any event, this is still an interesting shot, and of course they took several. One of them came out, a couple of them didn't, and this is what I could find. In that kind of way, when we're using this camera in an outdoor environment or in an environment with a lot of light, you can see that you can still get some really great effects, great results. Now, let's talk about when the camera does have inconsistencies. Here we go. Here's one when we're talking about an environmental shot that the detail is all crushed by the contrast, right? So the camera was not able to recognize uh, that the scene should have been brighter. It made the sky uh, the proper saturation and made everything else, but we lose the people that are there. In this particular instance, no lighten plus was chosen. And so the only thing that I could have done was told it to lighten the image up to one and a half stops. In this instance, since we were outside shooting in uh, normal mode on a sunny day, and I'm just reading my little 
<laughs> my little things here with uh, my little icons here with the camera in mountain mode, we know that it was using uh, an aperture of uh, f22, which means pressing the light and plus button would have allowed the shutter speed to be slowed by one and a half stops. Because it's using mountain mode, we know that it most likely was also using one four hundredth of a second. So a whole stop above that or below that would have been one two hundredth of a second, and a half a stop would have gotten us down to um, one one hundred and eightieth of a second. So we could have gotten quite a bit brighter of an image, it would have caused the sky to blow out a little bit, but we'd be able to see our subject a little bit better. That's the power and why this light and darken mode on this camera is so important because no other Fujifilm cameras, to my knowledge, other than the digital hybrid cameras, have that. And when I say digital hybrid, I'm talking about the Instax Mini Evo, the Instax La Play, the Square 10, the Square 20. Now let's look at another instance where it can get it wrong as well. Here we go. Uh, we're outside, we're photographing again, it's a bright day, and uh, we're in normal mode on this particular instance, and it has chosen too much light, right? It's overexposed. So uh, this is the type of inconsistency that you can expect, but this type of inconsistency is few and far between. Fujifilm has created this camera to work so well that generally speaking, you're not gonna have a lot of shots that you don't like. I can't think of too many. I've did, I did probably 30 videos on this camera talking about how to use this particular camera. You go check one of the playlists and you can see them. And you'll notice that taking this camera out and photographing was a simple process. I didn't get a lot of missed shots because of autofocus. That's because it's zone focused. So you set the zone, you're good to go. And I didn't really have a lot of exposure issues. I just enjoyed using this camera altogether. And in fact, this camera kind of launched my career as an instant photographer here in Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area. I became known for that because I was offering it and no one else was at the time. And then brides began to seek me out for these silly little prints. Now, once I started doing that, Mint Camera and I got together and I started using the Mint TL70, the original TL70, there's a TL70 Plus. And once I began using that camera, um, things got even better because its lens, uh, was one that you could choose an aperture up to 5.6 rather than 12.7. And I found out that with that camera for me, ND8 plus F8 was great. So I was able to get even better photos and photos that included that beautiful background bokeh. But that's a video for another day. So do I like this camera and suggest it in 2024? Yes, I like this camera. However, I've got to tell you the absolute God's honest truth. If you're going to pick up one of these cameras, I think you're better suited with the uh, Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo. And I'm talking at full price. I'm not talking at used or special sale price. And the reason is the Mini Evo, although it's a digital camera, which just has a share printer or a link printer built into it, although it's just a digital camera, it provides really, really great prints. I like them quite a bit. However, however, there is a caveat. There's a difference. You won't ever get an image like this on the uh, Instax Mini Evo. There's a slight and subtle bloom to how the image is focused here and how it developed. That's because, check this out, the image was actually exposed on the print, right, through a lens. And that lens invokes a particular characteristic or look. Now, would you notice that side by side? Yes, but we're being very pedantic here. However, I want to point out the fact that there is a difference when you expose through a lens directly onto the medium as compared to in this iteration of a lens on the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo. And this is going to work the same for the La Play or the Square 10 or 20. Had Fujifilm chosen a different lens on sensor set or chip for this camera, then you might be able to get a different look. But that would also require a lens that stuck out from the camera. These are the trade-offs that you make, and these are the considerations that you have. Even with that in mind, I would choose the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo today, given the choice between the two of them. I love the features that are built into it. I love the consistency that I get from it, and I can put up with its idiosyncrasies and quirks. I do recognize the images look different, but different isn't bad. A big consideration, the way I usually put it, 
is if you're looking for Instax to look more like Polaroid, remember those are two different brands, they're different things, then an analog Instax print will look more like Polaroid than a digital Instax print because the analog print is being exposed through a lens of some depth. There's actually some, some process going on there. It's in the camera obscura, there's a whole thing. And that camera obscura is the box that holds the, between the lens and the film. In any event, uh, I'm talking about that depth. Once again, I said this was really pedantic and I meant it in that way. It's, it's, it's really academic and it only matters, do you like the photos and can you tell? And for most people, I would suggest the Instax Mini Evo. But if you have an Instax Mini 90, don't feel bad by any means. You've got a great camera. If you could pick up an Instax Mini 90, uh, find one on sale or something like that, you will enjoy the camera and you'll be rewarded with your efforts for consistently good prints. My pro tips, just remember, don't use them at nighttime or in the dark and use them outside in bright light. And if you do use them in a darker environment, consider pairing them with a flash to just expand your creative options. Guys, I'm Rob with Robert Hand Photography. I hope that you have found this well. This is 2024, we're at 8,500 subscribers. Please, if you watched this far, you probably enjoyed the video. Hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost any money, but it helps me out dramatically. I've been doing this for over 10 years, where I'd really like to hit 10,000 subs this year. Guys, thanks for watching. I'll catch you all on the flip side.